drunken prophecies, libels, and dreams to set my brother Clarence and the king in deadly hate for one against the other. You know, it's funny. You, the more you read about him, the more you realize like how badly he got jobbed just by virtue of being on the losing side. We're doing it in somewhat of a Game of Thrones style because uh, a lot of the artists involved are real fans of Game of Thrones, and we think it's kind of topical and cool. And plus, it's an election year, so it's about an evil guy who's trying to take over the kingdom and and uh, all the machinations that get involved in that. Part of the wonderful thing about it is that this story is actual history. This is actual British English history. There really was a Richard III. There really was my character Buckingham. This is a real person. They actually did these things. So much of the history was rewritten because of the audience of the time they were writing it for was the winning side, not the Richard side. So there's a lot of, of skewed information in there that we we just really embraced it as a story, as, as a work of mostly fiction. By Buckingham, I say I would be king. Why, and so you are, my thrice-renowned liege. Ha! Am I king? It is so. But Edward lives. True, noble prince. Oh, bitter consequence that Edward still should live, true, noble prince. Cousin, thou would not want to be so dull. Shall I be plain? I wish the bastards dead and I would have it suddenly performed. This story has been studied for hundreds upon hundreds of years, over 400 years. And it's great to tell this story again to people who have never heard of it before. It's been fun to explore, you know, so, okay, so these people really had this kind of a relationship, so how, how can we use that, but staying true to the story that we're telling, not necessarily who the characters really were. A guy who has had a disability for his life has tried to overcome with just this kind of going on the bad side of the law and he just will do anything and take care, uh, kill anybody and do anything to get to the throne. Richard III is one of the darkest, evilest characters, not only in Shakespeare, but in all of literature ever. He says in the beginning, I have plots. It's like, he says to the audience, I'm gonna do some evil things and you're gonna watch me do it. Well, and I love how so much of the, the magic and the curses and the nightmares, everything has pretty tangible power in this world. Because Richard is just such a, a terrible, conniving human being, it's like just, just watching that kind of the machinations of, of him as he goes and he, he sets his plots and how like he basically plays a game of human chess. In this day and age, it's, it's not at all unusual. Our, our popular culture is thick with anti-heroes and sometimes straight up villains. It's a story that everyone wants to hear because it's it's real. It's the story of an underdog, you know. And, and no matter how malicious and and evil that underdog is, um, he's you, you want to see him succeed, you know. Even though he is technically the villain of the show, he's 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 technically the hero as well. Gosh, can you imagine if we could curse people now and get and that would that would have an effect? Like, what would that do? Without her falls to this earth and me to thee herself and many a Christian soul death. Desolation, ruin, and decay. It cannot be avoided but by this. It will not be avoided but by this! How do we make this character not likable, but hopefully by the end of it, the audience, whether they want to or not, is feeling a little bit for this guy. It's the whole journey from being a strong, independent queen at the top and, and then loses everything and having to have a, a fight to save the daughter. Like it's the weakness. You're you've lost everything. You're tired, but you need to fight to save your daughter. And then who wins in the end? We don't know. You have to show up. <laughs>